Hello, this is Father John Brown again from Holy Transfiguration Greek Orthodox Church, and we are continuing our series called Intro to Orthodoxy. This is the second of our classes, and in this class we will continue to look at the historical basis of orthodoxy in the early church. So let's go ahead and get started. Now that we have seen that there is a very extensive record of the writings of the early church fathers from the first four centuries of Christianity, we can see what they said about central topics. All the early church fathers believed in monotheism, that there is only one God. This came directly from our spiritual ancestor, Judaism. The unity of God was revealed in the Old Testament and is reaffirmed in the New Testament. But beginning with Christ, God reveals that he is one in essence, but three in persons. This, we can see this, this is one of several more verses which point to the threeness of God balanced with the unity of God. Our Lord says in Matthew 28, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. In 2 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul writes, The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. According to the knowledge of, foreknowledge of God the Father, in sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. So in all these and other verses like it, we see this balance of, that begins with monotheism as revealed to Judaism, but now it is beginning to be revealed that God is one in essence, but yet three in persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And this was picked up very quickly by the early church fathers, this oneness yet threeness of the Holy Trinity. Clement of Rome, the earliest of the apostolic fathers says, do we not have one God and one Christ? Is there not one spirit of grace poured out upon us? So you see God as Father, Christ, and the Spirit mentioned by Clement of Rome in the first century, probably while the apostle John was still alive. Justin Martyr also says, The most true God is the Father of righteousness. We worship and adore him, the Son who came forth from him and taught us these things, along with the host of the other good angels who follow and are made like him, and the prophetic spirit. Irenaeus writes of the Trinity, It is the Father who anoints. It is the Son who is anointed by the Spirit, and the Spirit is the unction. This continues with Irenaeus. It is after the image and likeness of the uncreated, uncreated God, the Father planning everything well and giving his commands, the Son carrying these into execution and performing the work of creating, and the Spirit nourishing and increasing. Clement of Alexandria in the first four centuries writes of what we call today and have called since the third century the Holy Trinity. The universal Father is one. The universal word is one, and the Holy Spirit is one. Clement of Alexandria writes, It is protected by the power of God the Father, and the blood of God the Son, and the dew of the Holy Spirit. Then we have Tertullian. For the very church itself is, properly and principally, the Spirit himself, in whom is the trinity of the one divinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. By the way, it was Tertullian that first coined the term Trinity that has been used ever since. Tertullian writes elsewhere, We believe that there is only one God, but under the following dispensation or economy, and for those of you interested in the Greek language, that word economy is economia, as it is called. We believe that this one only God also has a son, his word, who proceeded from himself, by whom all things were made, and without whom nothing was made. Him we believe to have been sent by the Father into the Virgin, and to have been born of her, being both man and God, the Son of man and the Son of God, and the Son also sent from heaven from the Father, according to his own promise, the Holy Spirit, the paraclete, which is another Greek word, which is comforter, the sanctifier of the faith of those who believe in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So you see very clearly and very early on, starting with the teaching of the fathers and continued with the apostles and continuing with the first four century fathers of the church, the awareness of the unity of God and the multiple, well, three persons within that one Godhead was clearly understood and clearly taught. Tertullian continues, 
he commands them to baptize into the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, not into the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, not, in, not, not into a universal, universe, unipersonal God, but a multipersonal God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It is the Father who generates an uncreated Son and brings forth a Holy Spirit, not as if he had no previous existence, but because the Father is the origin and the Son, a so the source of the Son or Holy Spirit, that's origin. The Savior and the Holy Spirit were sent by the Father for the salvation of men. That's from origin. Go, therefore, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. He suggests the Trinity, in whose sacrament the nations are to be baptized. Cyprian writes, the Lord says, I and the Father are one. And again, it is written of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. So the, the beginnings of the doctrine of the Trinity, and really all, it had very little to say after the fourth century to develop that idea, but that idea of the unity of God, yet the three, the three persons of the Godhead were all very all, already there and being refined over the first three or four centuries. Now, what did the early fathers say about the incarnation? Incarnation is a Latin word, which means in the flesh. This is the foundational Christian belief that God, specifically the second person of the Holy Trinity, became human in Jesus Christ. This is absolutely essential to the Christian faith and is a major focus of all Orthodox theology. The term incarnation is not to be confused with the term reincarnation, which means a human soul coming back to life over and over again in different bodies. So don't get those two confused, they're very different. The incarnation, that of God becoming man, is taught first in the New Testament. Our Lord says in John chapter, uh, John says in John chapter 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. The Apostle Paul writes in the book of Galatians, when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, under the law. So the entrance of the divinity into humanity through the womb of the woman, the, the Theotokos, is described here by Paul. Also continues in 1 Timothy, the apostle Paul writes, God was manifest in the flesh. God has become incarnated, has become entered fully into a human body, assumed a human soul, and participated in the fullness of human existence. The early church fathers also taught that in Jesus Christ, God has become fully human, yet remained fully divine. Ignatius writes, there is one physician who is possessed both of flesh and spirit. He is both man, excuse me, both made and not made. He is God existing in flesh, true life in death. He is both of Mary and of God. Ignatius writes, he was truly of the seed of David, according to the flesh, and the son of God, according to the will and power of God. He was truly born of a virgin. This is according to St. Ignatius. Justin Martyr writes, the first begotten of all creation would become incarnate by the virgin's womb and be a child. This was taught by Justin Martyr. Grineus writes, Christ Jesus, the Son of God, because of his surpassing love towards creation, humbled himself to be born of the Virgin. He himself united man to God through himself. Irenaeus also writes elsewhere, He took up man into himself, thereby the invisible became invisible, the incomprehensible was made comprehensible, the impassable became capable of suffering. So the Word was made man, and thereby summed up all things in himself. Clement of Alexandria, from the first four centuries of the church, writes, The Son of God, he who made the universe, assumed flesh and was conceived in the virgin's womb. It continues this constant understanding and reaffirmation of the uniquely Christian doctrine of incarnation, of God becoming human, is, continues here. Clement of Alexandria writes, the loving Lord has become man for us. Tertullian writes, This ray of God, then, 
is that as, as it was always foretold in ancient times, descended into a certain virgin and made flesh in her womb. He is in his birth, God and man united. Tertullian also writes, he who remitted sins was both God and man. Origen says of the incarnation. After he had been the minister of the Father in the creation of all things, for by him all things were made, he in the last times divested himself and became a man and was incarnate through, although he was still God. While he was made a man, he remained the God that he was. He assumed a body like our own, differing in only one respect, that the body was born of a virgin and of the Holy Spirit. This Jesus Christ was truly born, truly suffered, and truly died. Origen continues, after the consideration of questions of such importance concerning the being of the Son of God, we are lost in the deepest amazement that such a nature, preeminent above all others, would have divested itself of its condition of majesty and would have become man. Cyprian writes, although from the beginning he had been the Son of God, yet he had to be begotten again according to the flesh. In the second Psalm, he's quoting the Psalms now, the Lord said unto me, you are my son, this day I have begotten you. Ask me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance. Cyprian continues elsewhere. Christ is both man and God and compounded of both natures so that he could be a mediator between us and the Father. In Jeremiah, he's quoting now. Jeremiah says, being quoted by Cyprian, and he is man and will, who will know him? Also in numbers, a star will arise out of Jacob and the man will rise up from Israel. St. Athanasius writes, this proves that while to all the others the word came in order that they might prophesy, from Mary the word himself took flesh and proceeded forth as man, being by nature and essence the word of God, but after the flesh, man of the seed of David and made of the flesh of Mary, as Paul said. Him the Father pointed out both in Jordan and in the Mount, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Athanasius writes elsewhere, God became man so that man might become divine. By the way, that doesn't mean that we all become gods, but we, we are, as, the, as Peter writes in his epistle, we, are filled, we have the potential, the capacity to be filled with the fullness of God, that our cups will be full of him not that we become multiple gods. So like, that's, that's what Athanasios meant by that. Gregory Nazianzen writes this way, that which was not assumed cannot be healed. In other words, the incarnation of God was absolutely necessary because it was, if there was any part of humanity that was not taken and assumed and put on by Christ, then whatever that was that was not put on by Christ could not be healed by Christ's death and resurrection. The early church fathers all believed, without exception, in the virgin birth of Christ. It was taught both in the Old and the New Testaments. Isaiah says in a famous chapter we often hear around Christmas time in Isaiah 7:14, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. By the way, that word virgin is in the Septuagint translation of the Old Testament, which was before Christ, the translation of this, of the entire Old Testament from its original Hebrew into Greek, so that Greek-speaking Jews around the world could read it. It used the specific Greek word for virgin that was actually a little different than the word that was in the, in the Hebrew original, which was young woman. So this is part of why the church ever since, based on uh, this very careful and interesting and subtle translation of the word virgin is has been which was done before christ the orthodox see this as more or less a prophecy by translation that the virgin mary who would someday give birth to christ would be a virgin and not just simply a young girl matthew foretells of the virgin birth of christ or explains and re recounts the verse virgin birth of christ now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. 
So she was with child before and uh, before any physical relationship with Joseph or anyone else. And so that's also part of the biblical teaching of the virgin birth. Luke says this, Then Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I do not know a man? And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. So Mary was warned and well, warned and told and, uh, to by this the, the angel that she would be conceive and give birth, but without any human connection whatsoever, and that this would be accomplished by the Holy Spirit. So the early church fathers continued this central teaching of the apostles immediately before them. Ignatius says he was truly born of a virgin. Justin Martyr says, we even affirm that he was born of a virgin. Justin Martyr says elsewhere, here again how Isaiah in express words foretold that he would be born of a virgin. Irenaeus writes, Christ Jesus, the Son of God, because of his surpassing love towards his creation, humbled himself to be born of the virgin. Therefore, he united man through himself to God. Irenaeus also writes, he declared that the word would become flesh he declared that the Son of God would become the Son of Man, for the pure one opened pure, purely that pure womb that regenerates man unto God, for he himself made it pure. Clement of Alexandria writes, The Son of God, who made the universe, assumed flesh and was conceived in the virgin's womb. Tertullian wrote, This ray of God, again, that is always foretold in ancient times, descended into a certain virgin, and he was made flesh in her womb, so in his birth, God and man were united. Tertullian also writes, Whoever wishes to see Jesus, the son of David, must believe in him through the virgin's birth. He who will not believe this will not hear from him the commendation, your faith has saved you. Origen writes, A sign has been given to the house of David, for the virgin conceived was pregnant and brought forth a son. Origen writes elsewhere, he has made these remarks because he did not know the pure and virgin birth of that body that was to minister to the salvation of men unaccompanied by any corruption. What did the early church fathers say about the resurrection of Christ? There's, of all the central doctrines of Christianity, this is possibly the, it's definitely the first, and they're all important. You don't want, want to really rank them, but yet the resurrection of Christ was certainly the beginning point of the establishment of Christianity. At the empty tomb, the angels told the three women who came to the, anoint the body of Jesus, he is not here, he is risen. This has been the heart of the good news preached ever since. In all Orthodox Pascha, that is what we call Easter, all Orthodox Easter services, we continue to cry out these same words, Christ is risen, truly he is risen. Belief in the resurrection of Christ is absolutely essential and central to our faith. The Apostle Paul wrote of the importance of the resurrection. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Now if Christ is preached that he, he has been raised from the dead, how do some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty, and your faith is also empty. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile, you are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of, are, are of all men most pitiable. Without exception, the early church fathers proclaimed Christ is risen. Clement of Rome wrote, God has made the Lord Jesus Christ the first fruits by raising him from the dead. Ignatius says, for I know that after his resurrection also, he was still possessed of flesh, and I believe that he is so now. Justin Martyr 
the remainder of this psalm, which makes it clear that Christ knew his father would grant him all things that he asked and that his father would raise him from the dead. Now, many non-Orthodox Christians can read these writings of the early church fathers and can applaud them. They can applaud the early church fathers for affirming these essential tenets of the Christian faith, Trinity, Incarnation, Virgin Birth, Resurrection. Many non-Orthodox Christians see the presence of the Holy Spirit and sense the preservation of the pure gospel in these writings. However, many non-Orthodox Christians who know little about Orthodoxy might be surprised to learn that the Orthodox passionately believe in all these things and have for 2,000 years. However, many non-Orthodox Christians will also be surprised to learn that some of the other, of some of the other things that the early church fathers believed, taught, and practiced, that this is because some of the beliefs, teachings, and practices of the early church fathers are completely at odds with traditional Protestant beliefs, teachings, and practices, but are completely, completely aligned with Orthodox beliefs and practices. What did the early church fathers say about church government? The early church was governed by the apostles who appointed bishops who ordained presbyters, which is Greek for elder, and later become called, became called priests, to lead Christian communities. Once the apostles were gone, bishops gathered to appoint other bishops. The historical records demonstrate that the early church government was hierarchical, not congregational. Leaders were appointed by senior leaders, not elected by the congregation. And to be a bishop, one to had to, one to, had to have or be had to have a provable chain of succession going back to the apostles. One couldn't just say, well, I'm a bishop. And for you to be a bishop, you had to be consecrated to that office by other bishops. And all of those bishops had to have a demonstrable chain of succession going all back, all the way back to one of the apostles. The bishops and presbyters truly governed the church. Their authority was based on their connection to the apostles through what became known as apostolic succession. Because they followed in the footsteps of the apostles, this was the assurance that they were teaching and preaching what the apostles taught and preached. The Bible, the, the people were accountable to the presbyters and the presbyters were accountable to the bishops and the bishops were accountable to other bishops. There was only one church and not a series of denominations. Anyone who tried to start their own church was branded as a heretic and cast out of the church. Evidence of the church government, that the church government was hierarchical and not, congrega not congregational is seen in the epistles. The apostle Paul founded many Christian communities and clearly governed them either in person or by letter with all authority. For example, in his epistle to the Corinthians, Paul roundly scolded that church for their misbehavior. He certainly did not fear the wayward Christian church voting him out of office and voting in a new apostle to lead them in the way that they wanted. He commanded them. He, command, he candid, commanded them many places, including here. Now those are who are such we command and exhort through our Lord Jesus Christ that they work in quietness and eat their own bread. And many times where the Apostle Paul would just give orders. He would just say, this is what you will do. This is what you must do. This is what I'm instructing you to do. It was not a democracy. As uh, the early church, the apostles were not subject to vote or recall by a popular vote. They were put, given their offices by Christ, and that could not be taken from them at all. The New Testament also shows St. Paul appointed P Peter, and I, I could just as well or better say ordained Timothy, to govern in his absence. For this reason, I left you in Crete, that you should set in order the things that are lacking and appoint elders in every city as I commanded you. And so we see Paul the apostle ordained and consecrated Timothy to be uh, the bishop of Crete. So when Paul left, Timothy was the bishop. And part of the ministry of bishops is that they set everything in order and that they are the ones and only the bishops can appoint and ordain elders, as we call today priests, in, every, in the Orthodox Church. That was, the, that was the leadership structure of the church. 
Paul commanded the churches under his care and commanded Timothy to do the same. This is the hierarchical form of church government established by the apostles, and it was universal in the early church. You see Clement of Rome, the first, the oldest of all the apostolic fathers wrote. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, our apostles knew that there would be strife over the office of oversight and episcopacy, which comes from the Greek word overseer, which is translated into English nowadays, bishop. Accordingly, since they had obtained a perfect foreknowledge of this, they appointed those men already mentioned, and they afterwards gave instructions that when those men would fall asleep, other approved men should succeed them in their ministry. Therefore, we are of the opinion that those appointed by the apostles or afterwards by other acclaimed men with the consent of the whole church and who have blamelessly served the flock of Christ in a humble, peaceful, peaceable, and disinterested spirit and have for a long time possessed the good opinion of all cannot justly be dismissed from the ministry. So this is a, the earliest post-apostolic record that we have and is clearly teaching and describing this hierarchical form of church government. Ignatius writes, Ignatius was very adamant about this particular doctrine and he came along right after, after Clement of Rome did. So Ignatius writes the following, wherever the bishop appears, there let the people be, even as wheresoever Christ is, Jesus, Christ Jesus is, there is the Catholic, which in Catholicos, which means universal. There is the universal or Catholic church. You must follow, the, you must all follow the lead of the bishop as Jesus Christ followed that of the father. Follow the presbytery as you would the apostles. Reverence the deacons as you would God's commandment. Ignis, Ignatius elsewhere writes, be obedient to the bishop and to one another as Jesus Christ was in the flesh to the father and the apostles to Christ and to the father and to the spirit so that there may be unity in flesh and in spirit. Irenaeus wrote, when we refer them to that tradition which originates from the apostles, which is preserved by means of the successions of presbyters in the churches, they object to tradition, saying that they themselves are wiser, not merely than the presbyters, but even the apostles. So even in Irenaeus's day, there were people who wanted to go out and start their own church and set up their own bishops and set up their own presbyters. And, uh, but Irenaeus was saying that, so that was in existence even in these early days, but yet people who did so separated themselves from the, the one church and they were on their own. Irenaeus continues, in this order and by this succession, the ecclesiastical tradition from the apostles and the preaching of the truth have come down to us. And this is the most abundant proof that there is one and this same life-giving faith, which has been preserved in the church from the apostles until now, until now and handed down in truth. Tertullian wrote of, which describes the hierarchical form of early church government. Let them, which he, he was referring to the heretics, produce the original records of their churches. Let them unfold the role of their bishops running down in due succession from the beginning in such a manner that the first bishop of theirs can show he ordained him and the predecessor, one of the apostles or apostolic men, a man, a man moreover who continued steadfast with the apostles. For this is the manner in which the apostolic churches transmit their registers. For example, the church of Smyrna records that Polycarp was replaced there by John. Likewise, the church of Rome demonstrates that Clement to have been ordained in like manner by Peter. In exactly the same way, the other churches similarly exhibit their list of bishops, whom as having been appointed to their Episcopal places by apostles, they regard as transmitters of the apostolic seed. This is, this is Tertullian describing that apostolic session we're looking at. Origen writes, we cling to the standard of the heavenly church of Jesus Christ, according to the succession of the apostles. Cypri Cyprian writes, he cannot be reckoned as a bishop who succeeds no one. 
for he has despised the evangelical and apostolic tradition springing from himself. For he who has not been ordained in the church can neither have nor hold to the church in any way. How can he be esteemed as a pastor who succeeds to no one, but begins from himself? For the true shepherd remains and presides over the church of God by successful, successive ordination. Therefore, the other one becomes a stranger and a profane person and an enemy of the Lord's peace. What did the early church fathers say about baptism? Christ associated physical baptism, water baptism, uh, with the forgiveness of sins and the beginning of salvation. In theology, this is called baptismal regeneration. It's referred to in John chapter 3, just a few verses bef before the universally beloved verse, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. This was 11 verses before that verse, where Jesus says to Nicodemus, Jesus answered, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. At Pentecost, Peter associated baptism, water baptism, physical baptism, with the forgiveness of sins. We read in the book of Acts, which describes the events of Pentecost. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children, and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call. So baptism was one of the, when they asked Jesus, Peter, how are we saved? What should we do to be saved? Baptism was one of the four things that that was the answer to that question, what shall we do? That included water baptism. When Ananias baptized Paul, he associated baptism also with the forgiveness of sins. And Ananias received, the, uh, received Paul, who had just come from the Damascus Road and had seen miraculously the risen Christ and told Ananias, what had happened, Ananias told to Paul, arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. So that was one of the very first things that Ananias did for Paul is to have him baptized. And so that's been the case ever since within the Orthodox Church. Peter associated baptism with the forgiveness of sins. Peter writes in 1 Peter chapter 3, his, his, his first epistle, there is also an antitype which now saves us, namely baptism, not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience towards God. Paul associated baptism with the forgiveness of sins. He writes in Galatians 3, For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. He writes in Titus 3, 5, According to his mercy he saved us through the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. That washing of water, as is associated with water baptism, it is, in a sense, a, a washing, much like a, has some aspects of a bath to remove whatever dirt is upon us. In the book of Hebrews, it says, let us draw near with a, pure, with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. So that's, that's part of the, 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 the normal process of coming into the church, is water baptism. The early church fathers maintained what the apostles had taught them, just a martyr. This washing of repentance and knowledge of God has been ordained on account of the transgression of God's people, as Isaiah cries. Accordingly, we have believed and testify that the very baptism which he announced is alone able to purify those who have repented. And this is the water of life. For what is the use of that baptism, which cleanses only the flesh and body? Baptize the soul from wrath and from covetousness, from envy and from hatred. He writes elsewhere, but there is no other way than this, to become acquainted with his, this Christ, to be washed in the fountain spoken of by Isaiah for the remission of sins and for the rest to live sinless lives. 
Irenaeus writes, when do we bear the image of the heavenly? Doubtless when he says, you have been washed, believing in the name of the Lord and receiving his spirit. Irenaeus writes elsewhere, for as we are lepers in sin, we are made clean from our old transgressions by means of the sacred water and the invocation of the Lord. We are spiritually regenerated as newborn babes, just as the Lord has declared. Unless a man is born again through water and the spirit, he will not enter into the kingdom of heaven. This is, of course, a quotation from John chapter 3, which we just saw a few minutes ago. <clears throat> Clement of Alexandria writes, Thus also we who are baptized, having wiped off the sins that obscure the light of the divine spirit, have the eye of the spirit free, unimpeded, and full of light, by which alone we contemplate the divine, the Holy Spirit flowing down to us from above. Clement also says this, We are washed from all our sins and no longer entangled in evil. This is the one grace of illumination that our characters are not the same as before our washing. That was, if we understand this to be a very phys physical, literal washing in baptism. Tertullian writes, unless a man has been born again of water and the spirit, he will not enter into the kingdom of the heavens. These words have tied faith to the necessity of baptism. According, accordingly, all thereafter who became believers were baptized. So it was too that Paul, when he believed, believed was baptized. He writes elsewhere, unless a man is born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. In other words, he cannot be holy. Every soul then by reason of its birth has its nature in Adam until it is born again in Christ. Moreover, it is unclean all the time that it remains without this regeneration. And because it is unclean, it is actively sinful. Cyprian writes, one is not born by the imposition of hands when he receives the Holy Spirit. Rather, it is in baptism. Thereafter, being already born, he may receive the Holy Spirit. Cyprian also writes, In the baptism of water, there is received the remission of sins. Clearly, the earliest Christians believed that baptism was not a symbol, but a means of grace. They believed that our sins are forgiven by being immersed in water and the inv invocation of the Holy Trinity. They did not believe that our sins are forgiven by faith alone. So this concludes today's class. Thank you for joining me. We will have another session being posted in roughly a week. And so please uh, join us anytime you can. If you have any concerns or comments to make, please send it to that email address you see there. And I'll usually I can uh, res respond to them. So uh, have a blessed day. May the Lord God bless you. And we look forward to seeing you next time.